Before I, I start with the actual demonstration, I just want to point out a few resources which we have available for you to um, make the uh, learning curve a little bit less steep when you start with the SimNips. So one is actually the documentation which is included in SimNips itself, um, where we have these tutorials which really try to guide you step by step through uh, different parts. For example, when we now click here on optimization, just as one example, um, we would then have also code snippets, which you can then really run by just copying them into, into your Python um, window or also into the MATLAB window. In general, we always provide um, uh, examples for both. There are a few examples run in Python because SimNips is actually mostly written in Python, but um, for the large majority, we really always uh, support examples for both so that it's, it's easy for you to get started on that. Um, then I'd like to point out also our new SimNips YouTube channel, which so far is um, not very populated. Actually, it just contains one video so far. Uh, um, a first introduction video, but um, the, the plan is really to change that and also the, um, the introductions given today uh, will be uploaded and also from, from Alex team tomorrow will also be uploaded there so that you can then also just look into specific um, demonstrations for specific topics which you might be interested in then. Um, there are further resources, so people who like to read maybe just a summary paper, there's, there's in, in this this book, it's, it's, an, it's just freely available, it's open source. There's a, a chapter which again also summarizes um, the, the synapse from, our, from a more technical point of view or how to use it uh, point of view, um, also with a little bit like demo-like. So people more liking, some, liking to have something to print out can, can also look at that, for example. And finally, as a starting point for your own um, coding. Um, what you can also do is just go to the examples which are included in actually in, in the SimNips distribution. When you, when you download it and install it, then you have an example um, folder as well. And there you find again um, code snippets which can be used to run. Um, and as, again, as you see, most of them here are um, the much large majority is for MATLAB and Python and so on. So you can just decide, and this is really meant to be a starting point for your own um, for your own um, scripts, then which you can just um, uh, compile by by starting to modify those. Yeah, and with that, I actually already wanna stop my presentation here because my part of the presentation is is pre-recorded. I'll hand over then to Guillaume, who will play the video. So how we thought we do it. This, this um, introduction has in total three parts. And after each part, we make a small pause to, to take questions. But uh, smaller questions, we can also just take online um, um, via the chat. Uh, that's also, also one of the reasons why we, why we pre-recorded so that you can easily also answer on your questions on chat. So it's a little bit different to the, to the presentations uh, so far because this is also more like a software demo here. Um, so please also feel free to ask like small questions, minor questions on, on how to use SimNips just on the chat. We try to answer them and, um, during, during the, the videos. Otherwise, larger questions we can then also take them um, when, when pausing and discussing them a little bit more in, in detail. Yes, and with that, I'll, I'd like to stop, stop sharing here and hand over um, to Guillaume, who will then just start the, the practical session. Hello. Um, so I'll try now to share my the video. And please tell me if everything's going okay. Welcome to this tutorial, which is an introduction to SimNips. It's given by uh, my colleagues Ula Pronti and Guillermo Sardonino and myself. My name is Axel Kielcher. 
The introduction comes in three parts. I'll cover the first part where I'll introduce the basic workflow, how to generate an electric field simulation using SimLips. I'll demonstrate that actually using our graphical user interface. And while the simulations are then running, the calculations are running, I'll use the time to introduce a little bit of terminology um, in order to uh, make it a little bit easier to understand what the different output uh, names actually mean. And then looking and finally at the results. After that, my colleague Uda Ponti will take over. He will talk about how to uh, model heads, head, uh, second by head anatomy, um, based on MR uh, images and what, what you should care about when doing that. And after that, uh, Guillaume Saturnino will talk about how to systematically optimize electric fields and used by uh, brain stimulation. This would be a general workflow. Usually, we start with images of the subject, like here shown, a T1-weighted image and a T2-weighted image. The T2-weighted is optional, but we recommend to use it to have robust um, segmentation results, particularly here in the skull region. And we use those to segment um, the images and then to mesh it to have such a head model here. This is now an anatomical head model where it's indicated that here we would have skins, muscle compartments, we would have skull, here CSF, gray matter, white matter. And um, this is not fully sufficient. We still need to do a few more things. First of all, we have to convert this anatomical model into a, a physical model by saying, um, this uh, assigning conductivities, basically saying, okay, when you're here, then the, the head has a certain conductivity. When you're here, it has another conductivity. This would be, for example, a scalp. This would have a conductivity of around 0.4 sinus per meter. The blue one would be a um, skull. That would be a very low conductivity here of 0.01, as you see. And the red ones, for example, would be the compartments with the best conductivity here in the hand, which would uh, correspond to CSF. And the, the gray uh, and white matter of the brain are somewhere in, in, in between. Once you have done that, um, it's still not um, you're still not fully ready to start a simulation. You obviously also have to tell um, the where the TMS call is on the head, or alternatively, when you do an electric field simulation of um, electric simulation, um, then you have to assign basically you have to set where the um, electrodes are on the head. And you also have to assign the currents flowing into those electrodes and flowing out again. Or for a TMS coil, how strong the current flow through the copper windings of the coil are. Here for the electrodes, they also consist of conductive materials, which are also modeled here and attached to the head. This is done for each simulation newly. So this step, which is um, the most time intensive step to create this head meshes, um, you only have to do once, and this adding of electrodes is only done when it's needed, um, basically after you have set, up, set the simulation up in the graphical user interface. Then you're ready to run the simulation. Um, we use uh, um, the method called a finite element um, method for the, uh, solving um, the fields. There are other alternatives out, like the binary element method uh, in order to get the result which is for example, shown here for one example. This is would be now the your output, which you're most likely interested in, the electric field here on the brain surface. Um, actually, the, um, the calculation results represent the field in the complete head here. Usually, we restrict the visualization only to the part which you're interested in, which is uh, in the, the brain. But you can also explore the other parts if you um, have certain um, interest in that. This is another view of the pipeline. Again, we would start with the images of the subjects, which we then would run through um, the head modeling procedures. And again, Ulla will talk about that more later on, to then set up the simulations in the graphical user interface. That's something I'll focus on here. And then also I'll focus on how to then look at the results of the simulations, which then run automatically using um, a viewer called GMesh or also FreeView. 
if you want, you can also have information from diffusion tensor imaging, which can be helpful to inform you about the uh, conductivity of the white matter compartment. Um, because uh, white matter is very structured, has, has very structured fiber bundles. It's thought that the conductivity is also anisotropic, and it's thought that um, diffusion tensor imaging actually can be used to inform you about the um, conductivity anisotropy um, inside white matter. So when you have a diffusion tensor image of the brain, you can use it to estimate the conductivity anisotropy and use that to assign that to the to the uh, fem calculations. This is again an optional step. When you don't have your own T1 or T2 weighted images, then we also uh, provide a few example um, head models so that you can get started um, easily. So let's start with setting up a simulation. For that, I pause here the presentation. And we go to the graphical user interface. First thing is to select our head mesh with our example data set. We um, provide three different head meshes. One is a simple sphere, one is the MMI head, and one is, is the so-called Ernie data set, which I'll work now in the following. Each of these or these data sets then contain an M2M folder, which contain the actual um, detailed information of the heads. So Ernie has this M2M folder, so select this one and wait a little bit until the data is loaded. So now we are ready to set up the simulations. What you see here is the scalp of Ernie. You can also look at the brain. And um, it's relatively easy to set up simulation now. Let's start with a TTCS simulation. Just clicking this button brings up this list of positions, currently empty. So let's add an electrode and assign it a position. Let's say we want to stimulate our C1. So we could just now set C1, this position of it. When you're not fully happy with the orientation of the electrode, we can change that later on. Let's first assign a shape. Now we have a seven by five centimeter electrode. We can preview its shape. As you see, there's a certain distance here um, to the scalp. This is because it's just a preview. It's not the real electrode model, which is then added to this head mesh once you start the simulations. Um, this preview is just to help you um, having an getting an impression on how the electrode looks like, how large it is, on its orientation. So here it's now orientated like that. We might want to orientate it a little bit more to follow or be aligned with the um, direction of the central sulcus. And that you could, for example, do by changing its position simply by double clicking. So double clicking here, double clicking here. And now we have changed that. Yeah. Let's also define a return electrode, maybe here above AF4. So let's add another electrode. And let's try whether AF4 is good. Otherwise, we'll update it later on. We can actually use the same shape. Yeah, um, the shape looks fine. Maybe the direction not so nice. So let's update that one. Can preview, yeah, better. Maybe one more time. Okay, that looks fine. Now we are more or less ready. Obviously, we still have to assign the currents which flow into the electrodes. Let's use, use here one milli, uh, one milliampere and minus one milliampere for the return electrode. And then we're done um, with the TDCS um, simulation. 
let's also um, set up our team as simulation where the first thing is to define a call which you want to use let's use this maxdim call here for example it's a pretty standard um, double call and again we have to define positions for example you could say um, well let's use c1 as it seems to be roughly above the hemp now, and this is not um, fully um, satisfactory for us. We can also improve it a little bit by again defining an individual position, maybe directly above the hemp knob here for Team S. So that looks quite nice now. Now we're ready. You might see this uh, skin distance. So what it means is that we don't assume that the TMS call is directly here on the skin, but that the TMS call has a little bit of distance, namely four millimeter to the skin. The reason why we do is that we take, by that we try to take into account that um, people obviously also have hair, or there might be some some cap which they wear um, during stimulation, um, for example, to attach the um, DRF for the, of the neural navigation system. Um, but feel free to add uh, alter that when you have more detailed information or when you think it's not appropriate. Just um, report it in your um, simulation results. Then we also have to define the strength of the current in the TMS call or more detailed, the rate of change of the current in the TMS call. And for TMS um, simulators from adventure, it's actually relatively straightforward. You just look at the panel, the panel states you um, directly this value and you can just copy it over. For other stimulators like Mixdim, it's a little bit more involved. There the stimulation intensity is um, defined um, in percent of the maximum stimulator output and then you have to convert that value to um, to the DIDT value with a, with a little of a equation. If you're only interested in the shape of the uh, field and we don't care about um, its absolute intensity, then you can just leave it here at the standard value. Um, otherwise, when you want to really have individual um, electric field strength estimates, um, then you have to enter the proper value here as well. But um, that is all we have to define there. So now if we define point coil orientation, we could have several of those, uh, which would then just have a result in, in two or three or four, depending on how many we defined um, simulation results, which you can then look at or analyze separately from each other. So now we are ready to run, and the results will be then placed in this output directory. In case this would already exist, um, the graphical user interface would complain because you don't want to, uh, you to unintentionally mix up simulation results from different runs, uh, then you would have to give a new. Um, the last thing before I start is that I want to highlight a little bit the simulation options which we have. As standard, we simulate the electric field. That's why these two things here are tipped. Um, we can also instead um, simulate the current uh, density or both. Um, they are more or less uh, telling you the same story because they are, uh, the current density and the electric field are related to each other and by the connectivity. So once you, you know uh, the current density and the connectivity, you can, can calculate the electric field or vice versa. There are a few um, options to tick here. Um, instead of just looking at the results here on this head mesh directly, you can also look at it on its individual cortical surface. I'll um, explain a few things about that later on. Or you can take it further to um, group spaces. Um, like the average space, which is uh, average cortical surface um, of, of many subjects, basically, um, so that you can do group averages of fields on these surfaces there, for example. If you prefer to uh, work further with the fields in, in nifty volumes, you can also do that. This would be just as individual output, or you can also transform it to MNI space um, and do your analysis there. I'll um, now tick here all three so that we can then look at the um, output results which are stored in different subfolders of this folder here 
um, and explore them a little bit later on. And with that, I'm um, ready to start this simulation. And here we go. And I'll use that time to go back to the um, presentation to explain a little bit about the terminology. When looking at the results of electric field simulations, then it's useful to um, realize that electric fields are vectors, so they have both a, a strength, which is here indicated as the length of this vector, and the direction. And then the question is um, what the interesting parts are to report. First, a little bit about how we name them in, in SimNips. So the electric field strength is mathematically also um, termed the, as the norm of the vector. That's why we call the electric field strength, which is just length here, the norm E or E norm in some of the results also. And um, as alternative, you might be also interested in looking at the direction. And one useful direction is actually uh, looking into the amount of the current, so that would be the electric field, the total electric field, the amount of this electric field which either flows into the cortex or out of it. Um, so this would be the local orientation here of this part of the gray matter. And we want to uh, look into the, or we are interested now here in the part which is either flowing perpendicular or also normally, normally into the gray matter or out of it. That's called e normal field. The same um, naming convention is also followed for J, where um, the length of the J vectors, so this, the strength of the current density, is again called norm J, versus the um, part of the current density which either flows into the cortex or out of the cortex is called um, J normal again. In um, electric stimulation, this is also called an anodal stimulation here in red, or that would be correspond to the cathodal stimulation of this cortical sheet here. So what to report then? For TMS, well, first of all, we think that in TMS, we mostly stimulate the cortical sheet. This is here one representation of a cut through here through the hand knob area of the subject nicely visualized with, with the different types of uh, neurons here for, taken from um, the um, publication from Abera, um, from um, the Peter Schiff group here. And what uh, we think happens in TMS, at least according to, to this model, this very detailed model, and also matching um, basically ex experiments which systematically compare electric fields with MEP, MEP changes uh, above the motor cortex. Uh, there. What we think here is, is that um, the neurons are actually stimulated at the ends of the axonal collaterals. And because the axonal collaterals uh, have many different orient orientations, um, it's actually not so important um, how the field is directed. So to a first rough approximation, we think that the electric field strength is the dominant factor which determines whether um, neural excitation occurs or not. This is also again visualized here. This would be the um, representing the neural excitation strength here for these um, for these neurons for the primal cells here, which just by visual comparison corresponds nicely with the electric with the electric field strength at these positions. So to a first approximation, and we think that. Uh, we can report electric, electric field strength distribution to get a rough idea on, on where we stimulate in the cortex. I'd like to highlight here that also there are other hypotheses. Mm. Some think that the normal component, so basically the part of the field which flows into the cortex locally or outside the cortex, um, is the important part. For electric stimulation, um, we have the concept that we have a cathodal or a nodal stimulation. This stems already from this very early experiments from Bindman, where we lead currents normally through the gray matter sheet, and by that either increase 
or decrease uh, baseline firing rate for cathodal stimulation, we decrease it, for neural stimulation, we increase it. Um, by, by this current, what we think happens there is that uh, by this current flow, uh, in either in inside the cortex or out of the cortex, uh, we polarize the pyramidal cells so that their soma is either um, a little bit depolarized, which would then enhance baseline firing, at the same time that dendritic tree would be hyperpolarized a little bit, or vice versa, when we sh um, shift the currents around or the electric field around, then the opposite would happen, then the soma would be slightly hyperpolarized, while the dendritic trees uh, would be slightly depolarized. So there we expect to have a certain directional effect uh, depending on the normal component of the electric field, and that's why it can be useful to um, also look at the um, normal components instead of only the electric field strength. Again, um, physiology is quite complex, so this view is simplified. Um, we know that also electric fields perpendicular um, to the neurons here can um, affect um, neural um, activity, likely by polarizing the axon terminals. So again, it might be interesting to not only explore this component, the normal component, but also other components of the electric field. How does it then look like? As uh, to give some example here. So when we look at the electric field strength, here for a bipolar F3 F4 montage, as for example, tested for depression treatment with TTCS, then we see that, well, we have electrodes here. And even, even though we try to focus stimulation here on this part and also on the control thrust side, we see that we actually have very strong currents here also in other more electric fields here in other parts here of the brain. When we look at the normal component, we see a quite interesting pattern because we have a, um, a current in, in the systematic um, outflow, inflow, outflow. So we ha would have a cathodal stimulation mostly here under this electrode, then because the currents have to um, basically flow here in this direction from here to here. Um, we then have an inflow of the currents here in the, in the hemisphere cleft as seen here on the um, right hemisphere. Well, when they flow into the right hemisphere, then they have to fl uh, flow out of the left hemisphere here on that side. So here we would have again a cathodal stimulation and on the other side we would have again a nodal stimulation. So we have like a um, plus minus plus minus pattern here which makes the interpretation of this whole montage relatively complicated because um, it's, for example, thought that um, also areas here in this region um, are really important um, for um, important regions for uh, which are affected in, in people suffering from depression. So even though this montage was initially designed to stimulate TLPFC, it does much more complex things, most likely. Again, this is just a hypothesis now um, derived from this electric field pattern, but at least this can highlight us to the fact that um, it can be very useful to explore those uh, those field simulations uh, to um, come up with um, um, possible hypothesis on how certain montages might uh, result in specific physiological and behavioral effects. With that, I'd like to end this um, slide presentation and go back to the simulation results. So the simulations have finished, as shown here. And um, this then now resulted in a lot of, or a few um, fields here visualized in the viewer. I'll go through them in a minute now um, in more detail, so I just close them for now. This is just a convenience function that you can have them immediately available. But I think it's more useful when we now look into um, the simulation um, output folder and take it step by step. As you see, it contains four subdirectories, which I'll explore later on. And then it contains result files for two um, simulations, one and two. The one, the first one was a TCS simulation. And the second one was a TMS simulation, where you also find the name of the coil. Um, the output is uh, always stored in the results file with the dot mesh um, 
endings. Let's look at that. This takes a little bit of time to load. In the meantime, I actually like to highlight a few more output files. First of all, you have here a simple text file, which gives a very rough summary of the results. Um, again, for the two simulations here, um, one and two. Um, so you get some peak field values here, and you get also some focality um, um, values as a result here. And as you see, for example, the TDCS um, focality is far worse than the TMS focality, which is expected for an unfocal montage, just a demonstration on how to read these values. And the TTCS uh, fields are also weaker than the electric fields of TMS, even though this is not too meaningful here because I didn't scale here the stimulation intensity to the output of the stimulator, I just with the standard values. Usually these values would be still much higher when you um, scale them properly to the individual simulation intensity which you need for, for a specific subject. You also have a log file in case something went wrong, we might ask you to send this. And this is um, a settings file which you can again actually load into the graphical user interface and then go on modify it there. Or alternatively, you can also actually load that into Synapse, uh, sorry, into MATLAB or Python and edit it there. Uh, to adapt the simulation and run it again. But now the results have been loaded. For the TDCS montage, as you see, as expected, you have in one electrode here, one electrode here, you have a strong current flow in between, which means that you have also strong fields here, especially at some of the gyro crowns here. Now what we see here is a visualization as a standard here on the pile surface, so the outer surface of Grammeter. And you could argue that this might be not too informative because here actually there are no um, neural cell bodies. Um, so mm, instead of looking at the outer surface, we might rather want to look into, into the gray matter and maybe something like the central layer or the middle layer of the gray matter surface to have a better impression on the electric field distribution at a position in gray matter where also neural excitation is likely occurring. I'll show you how to do that in a, in a, in a minute. First, I want to go on to um, actually the um, TMS montage. Also quickly look at the results. So, as expected, um, the TMS is the montage is resulting in a more focal field, which is uh, focused here on the hand knob. That's where we centered our curl. We can confirm that by looking at this uh, small visualization of the coil central axis and its main orientation. So that would be a typical field for a double um, double coil uh, double um, coil. coil. Let's close this again and look a little bit more into detail into this um, subfolders. Let's start with the subject overlays. What you find again there is you again find two mesh files, one for the first a simulation result, um, which was a TTCS field, and the second one for the TMS field. So let's double click this one. Looking more or less, less like the same because it's the same simulation, but now uh, the electric fields are actually read out here in the uh, central um, or the middle of the cortical layer, which is um, more, more useful likely. Also because by that we can actually nicely see into um, the uh, sulky, which is a nice side effect of that. So this is not an atrophic brain, it just means that instead of looking at it uh, at the pile surface, the outer surface, of the gray matter we look into, we have interpolated the field at a um, central layer. Here, because now we have a surface available, which gives us a clear orientation, we can also look at the normal component of the field relative to the surface. So let's look at that. Look at that. And then um, it looks a little bit differently. So here now suddenly things become red and blue. 
um, for um, in an outflow. We see that um, most currents are flowing consistently in one direction here. So they flow um, to the return electrode. So most of the areas close to that are blue. And here it's getting more red, um, meaning that they again consistently flow from, from, from one side to the other. But you also see that here in the hand knob area, it's actually quite consistent red, not fully here, it's a little bit of blue, but here this part is consistently red. And this might also explain, explain why these montages um, achieve their physiological effects, because in your target area, in your area of interest, you have a little bit of a consistent stimulation with bond polarity, which then hopefully creates uh, some kind of specific physiological effects. You also see that because you have this current flow from here to here, you have a clear cut um, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue pattern. Let's look at the same result for um, the TMS simulation. Again, here you see a little bit better into the sulky. Or you could also look into um, the normal component, which, as said, is probably not as predictive of neural excitation as the strength is. So here it might be more useful to look mostly at the strength of the electric fields. Now here are all kinds of other files but they actually contain exactly the same information, just stored in another, in another format. Here we would have, uh, for the left hemisphere, the results for the TTCS simulation, so uh, simulation one. Here we would have the electric field norm, so that would be the electric field strength. Here it would be the electric field normal component, meaning the part of the electric field which flows into the cortex or out of it. And further down, we would have the same for the right hemisphere. The reason it is stored in this um, format as well is it's uh, actually the same format which is used by FreeSurfer um, to store coverture data. So in case you prefer uh, to, for example, use FreeView to visualize the results, you can use those. Or in case you prefer to use those um, results for further post-analysis or uh, post-processing, then you can use those. But actually, um, the data in those um, files is exactly the same as already stored in those two dot .mesh files. And just your own preference, what you actually prefer. Let's look also a little bit further. There's again an overlay, which means that uh, subfolder, which means that it's uh, visualization on some surfaces. Again, more or less the same name. We have Ernie, which was the subject ID. Um, we have a TGCA simulation and it was the first simulation. So let's again look at it to see what's different. Well, as you see, the brain now looks massively different and this is because it's not um, the individual cortex of the subject, but it's the FS average template um, where the results were mapped onto after they have been calculated in the, for the individual anatomy. And this can be quite useful when you want to do group analysis. Here you can, for example, make a group average electric field quite easily by transforming them into the, onto this FS average template and then doing an average. Again, you can also look at the electric field um, normal component. And you see this red blue pattern, um, which now doesn't follow the gyrification anymore closely. This is simply because this is an average brain here where much of the detailed um, anatomy is, is actually lost. But what you see still is that here in the hand knob region, you have this red region, red region, and on the other side, the blue region. So the, the big landmarks are still, still maintained. You also still see that when you are here closer to the return electrode, you actually have more blue. And here you do have more red. So this is Again, in just another uh, way of visualizing the results here on this average anatomy in case you want to go further and, for example, do um, averages of, of the fields of several subjects. The same again for the TMS.
centered here on the hand knob. And similar to the output folder before, um, we have all these sub um, results, which are again in FreeSurfer format, in case you prefer this format for analysis of your results. Otherwise, you can just stick to the dot mesh results. The last thing is that um, often nifty volumes, so voxel space is, is preferred. We also support that. We can look either into the um, individual um, space of the subject given by the individual T1. Again, here the two different simulations, entity cell simulation and the TMS simulation, either the electric field as vector. So this is a 4D file with X, Y, Z um, components of the electric field, or here the norm of the field, so the strength of the field. Normal components with the part which flows into the cortex or out of the cortex is missing here because here in, in a voxel format, we don't have a surface orientation, so we can calculate that. These results we can also take further to MNI template, to the MNI template, for example, to do a two kind of groups analysis. So again, the same um, nomenclature. Uh, um, so with TTCS and TMS for the one and two simulations, now with the addings of MNI, that's clear that's in an MNI space. In the last few minutes, I want to use to look a little bit into um, those results using Freeview here. So first, let's look into um, this T1 of the subject. This is the individual T1 of Ernie, but um, morphed non-linearly onto the MNI template. This would be the MNI template. This would be um, the um, T1 of the subject. Um, when you have such a um, simulation folder, here the M2M folder, then you have a 2MNI folder. And inside, you have then this file, which I already have opened, uh, which is then the T1 again, but now in MNI space. There are also a few more files. One is the Grameta MNI file, which is also created uh, as a standard thing. And I load that now because I'll you know, highlight its use later on then a bit. So now let's also actually um, just go to uh, the simulation results, which are stored here. Let's go to the MNI volumes and, for example, load the uh, TTCS electric field strength and also the TMS electric field strength into Freeview. So what you see here as a first thing is that, um, well, maybe the first thing is to change a little bit um, the color map here. And let's start with the TMS simulation. You see in general that the fields are somehow focused here. This is basically bare where the coil was positioned, but the fields are calculated in the complete volumes and they're also stored in the complete volume so that you can see the fields actually in skin, in, in, this, in the skull, and then also in the brain. Yeah, usually we are only interested in the brain, so you might then wanna actually adjust the intensity scale to um, highlight more the parts of the field which are in the brain, and then it gets so here you start seeing now, this would be now our proper scaling. And then you see that obviously the fields here are, are really stronger. Um, so it might be nice to be able to mask the fields a little bit. And that's why we have included the gray matter mask here in, gray in, in the MNI space. This is not automatic, but what you can do now is you can um, basically uh, load mask and this result in, in Python or, or MATLAB and just apply this mask to the fields to only have the field in gray matter. And why this is particularly useful is um, that um, we have here individual anatomies in MNI 
in high space and they obviously are courageous at all to the MNI template, but they're uh, they're never perfect as you see here. So uh, this is the visual gray matter space and in the background we have the MNI template. In some position it fits better, but actually here it would be more in the CSF of the template, but um, here it's it's clearly the hand block of the subject. So um, and when you have several of these subjects, then all these the gray matter will be a little bit different. And because the field distribution depends um, on on the distribution of tissues and scales directly with that. Um, for example, we see here that the fields here of for team S are generally stronger in white matter, or maybe go here, than they are in in in, in gray matter. Um, it's actually good to have sub subject specific masks in M and I, which we can easily apply um, to the simulation results to then only look at the um, specific um, field of the subject in M and I space, which is also really corresponding to gray matter, namely the tissue where we know that we stimulate. So let's do the same with GCCS here. It's quite astonishing to see that the strongest fields are actually not in the brain, but in the skull. And this is simply because we have a strong current or the currents have to go from the skin through the skull into the brain. And uh, because skull is very low conductive, this causes this quite strong fields inside the skull. But when we change the scale slightly, then we see that um, we now have the fields in the cortex again back. Again, we're not really interested in those. So instead of reporting or looking at the fields here in the skull region, you might rather apply this individual gray matter mask um, in MNI space to those field results and then specifically only look at the result re resulting field, um, which then would correspond to the field in, in gray matter. And also not in white matter because we're relatively sure that we don't stimulate in, in white matter when we, when we talk about uh, TTCS. So these are not the most pretty uh, visualizations now. Um, the main part here which I wanted to highlight is that when you transfer results to an MNI space, then they obviously don't uh, fit perfectly. The field simulation results don't fit perfectly to the MNI template uh, simply because um, the registration will never be um, uh, perfect. Um, the individual anatomy just contains more details than the, the template. And in order to account for that and not mix the fields from different tissues like gray matter, um, white matter, or CSF, we supply or we suggest that you also um, use this gray matter mask, uh, the subject specific gray matter mask, to only read out the electric fields inside this gray matter mask and then go on with the analysis from there. For example, could intersect the screen meta mask and further with the region of interest in the MNI space so that you have an average field in this region of interest um, for this specific subject, which only corresponds to the uh, field which is then um, in gray matter. And with that, I'd like to stop this part or end this part of the introduction and hand further on to Ula um, for the next part. Right, my name is uh, Ola Puanti, and I'll cover the second part of the SimNips uh, introduction, which is uh, the head modeling part. So uh, here you can see some of the points I'll talk about. Uh, the first is I'll quickly show how to create a head model um, from the MR images using Hetrico and SimNips. I will not run the, the whole Hetrico pipeline, just show how to call it. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about how to check the segmentation accuracy of the resulting head model and what to look out for in terms of segmentation inaccuracies. Then I'll show uh, a little bit how, this, uh, how the segmentation accuracy affects the simulated electric fields. Um, and finally, I'll give some tips on what kind of MR settings um, and MR scans you should input to Hedrico to have robust head models or robust uh, segmentations and, and also accurate head models. Um, so to generate an uh, uh, individualized head model in SimLips is quite easy. You open a terminal 
uh, and then you call this uh, Hetrico, which is the head reconstruction pipeline uh, pipeline SimNips. And the first argument is is this all, which means that you should run all steps. Um, then you should uh, you should input the subject identifier. Here I'm using Ernie, uh, which is our example um, subject. And then after that, uh, you put in the MR scans. So uh, the one you have to, there's mandatory, the first argument is mandatory. So you should put in the T1 weighted scan. And then um, additionally, if you have a T2 weighted scan, you can also uh, include that. And we recommend always to have uh, also T2 weighted scans because typically these make uh, the segmentations more accurate and, and robust. And these don't need to be co-registered. Uh, the head recall pipeline will, will register them for you using SPM. Uh, and if you forget how to call head recall, then there's always this head recall dash H command where you can get the help. And I'll actually show it here. So I have my terminal open here. Uh, and now if I type head recall dash H, it gives me uh, all the different steps you can run. Uh, so these would be arguments to Hetrico. And if I write Hetrico all dash H, um, I get more uh, specified help for this uh, specific step, which is basically running all the different steps. So here again, I can see the usage. So I would call Hetrico all. And um, the arguments in, in these brackets are optional. So you can see that the mandatory arguments is the subject identifier and the input files. And additionally, you can have multiple input files like T1 and T2. All right, let's uh, get back to the talk here. Yes, so once um, Hedrick has run and you will successfully, in the end, you will have a mesh. And then you should always check um, that the segmentations and the generated surfaces uh, look good. Um, and I will show how that works. You would use this check command. So again, you call first head reco, then the first argument is uh, to do the check, and then you use your subject identifier. So here I have already run head reco once. So let's clear this. Uh, so I have uh, here Ernie, uh, and I've already run head reco on this, so I'll write head reco check. Ernie. And now we'll take some, maybe 30 seconds, no, maybe less. Um, so it will open two viewers. In this case, I'm using Freeview. Um, so the first window it opens, I'll change the contrast here. I'll change something. So here we have the MNI template, and it shows you two registration. One is the 12 degrees of freedom uh, register, registration to this MNI template, and the other one is the nonlinear registration here. So these, oops, uh, so these uh, registrations are used to transform the, the electrode positions from the MNI space to the individual space. So you should check that the registration looks okay, so there's nothing weird going on, and the, the the MNI template and the, the registered T1 match. Uh, so the, for example, the skin contours match and the, the skull looks fine and there's no weird deformations. And this looks fine as expected as this is our example subject. So I'll close that window. The second window shows you the, um, uh, the segmentation results and the surfaces. So I'll click off this, uh, this volume segmentation, which is this, this colored overlay. And I will change the contrast a little bit so we can see the MR clearer. And then it shows you these, um, these tissue boundaries. So I'll change the head tissue boundaries to be red so it's easier to see. And usually for the brain, we don't see so many segmentation errors where the segmentation errors happen typically in, this, uh, in sort of the inner skull border or the outer skull border. So I'll click off this brain uh, surfaces. And here what you should sort of check is the, that the, the inner skull border and the outer skull border follow the, the intensity gradients in the image. Uh, 
so that it looks like the, the skull borders are segmented okay and also that the outer skin border is segmented accurately. And you can scroll through the image a little bit here in, in preview and see that the, the borders look fine. And in this case, it doesn't seem that we have any clear uh, segmentation errors here. And this is again expected as, as this is our example subject. I'll quickly just show how to do this check uh, on Windows if you don't have this Linux subsystem. Now I was running Freeview that is installed on uh, in this Linux subsystem. So there's this viewer called MRI Cro GL, which you can download uh, for Windows. Uh, and here it's a bit simpler, but you can do a rough check here as well. So you would open the input scan. So again, I have Ernie here. So I'll take the T1. This new is the intensity corrected, so bias corrected scan. So I'll open that one. Um, so here you can see the scan and the three views. And then I'll add an overlay here. And as an overlay, I'll pick this Ernie final contour. So this is the volume segmentation. And I'll open that. Now this color map looks a bit weird. You can change it here. And what I'll typically use is this NIH color map. So now you can see the different tissues. Here we have the opacity slider. So you can change the opacity. So you see the underlying uh, underlying MR scan. You change the opacity a little bit. So you see both. And then you can scroll around and see that there is no weird segmentation uh, errors going on. Click this off and back on again, just to see that the, the volume segmentation looks good. So this is a way to check it on Windows if you don't have a free view uh, or free server installed. All right, let's go back to the presentation here. Yes, um, so why is it important to check uh, sort of segmentations? So here I'm showing, um, uh, an example of a T1 weighted scan with fat suppression. So you can see here uh, that the spongy bone signal, for example, uh, spongy bone is a fatty tissue. Uh, so it's, it's suppressed and here also the fat uh, in the scalp is also suppressed. Here I'm showing the, the heterico uh, segmentation, which is SPM based. Um, and here I'm showing uh, the skull reconstruction from CT for the same subject. And you can clearly see that the, the, the skull is here uh, from Hetrico is underestimated, so we get this, uh, the, the spongy bone is not segmented correctly, and the skull is, uh, skull is much thinner here than it actually is in reality. Um, you can also have uh, non-fat suppressed scans, um, where you can now clearly see that the, the spongy bone and the, the fat tissue in the skin really pop out uh, much more than in this scan. Um, and here we now uh, get the inner skull border segment a little bit better and the, the outer skull border is catch on as well, but the, but uh, the segmentation misses the spongy bone part. And again, we have this sort of uh, missed part of the skull here. Uh, when the non, so you can change the MR parameters of the non-fat super scan to make the, the fat shift actually. So here we have a fat shift in the up direction and here in the down direction. And you can see that uh, in both cases, we get segmentation errors, but they're a bit different. So in this case, the fat shifts towards the cortex and the inner skull border disappears and the method only catches the outer skull border uh, and misses the inner part. So this gets segmented in the skin. And clearly this is also not, not so good. So uh, typically uh, how you can get rid of this is to also uh, include a C2 weather scan. Of course, these examples that I'm showing here are very sort of worst case scenarios. So often we see that it uh, Hetrico works fine uh, for T1 weather scans as well, uh, where we have fat suppression. But the most robust uh, results we typically achieve for a combination of T1 and T2 weather scan. And here you can now see uh, that the skull is segmented accurately and it matches the, the CT. CT quite nicely. So I'll actually show an example of how the check looks like for a case uh, which doesn't 
if I can do so well. So I have this sub subject zero nine here. And again, I have processed this with head people before, so I have run head people sub zero nine. And this will open preview again. And yeah, first we see uh, the MMI transformation. So I'll just show this nonlinear one and I can browse around a little bit again. Uh, and it looks like there's nothing weird going on here. So I'll close that one. And here we see the, the segmentation of the surface again. So I will close the volume segmentation. I can change the, the color of the brain surface and I'll take off the brain surface here and then we can see. Um, so here you see now, again, if I click off the brain surface, we have this, this fat shift. So this fat layer, wait a second, I'll change the contrast here. Yes. Um, so the fat layer here is shifted down. So it actually should be here where this dark rim is and also the spongy bone. Here is shifted towards the cortex. I'll change the view a little bit. So here the, the spongy bone should be actually higher, shifted down. So now if we look at the, the segmentation, we can clearly see that this, this skull is uh, segmented very thin, uh, thin, and it completely misses the spongy bone part, which is similar to what we saw before in the example that I showed on the slides. So in this case, uh, this is clear quite big segmentation error. And if we don't have a T2 weighted scan for this subject, uh, this should be corrected uh, either manually or, or then changing the, the, the segmentation parameters, which is something uh, we can also give uh, information about, about if you contact us um, uh, through the support at simnips.org uh, email address. All right, so that would be an example of a bad segmentation. Um, so um, it's probably quite clear that uh, going back to this uh, talk that if, if the skull is very um, under segmented then the fields that you would see in the brain uh, are much higher than what you get in reality because the, the skull is actually much uh, much thicker. But there is, um, there is actually uh, a more sort of uh, uh, smaller, like even smaller uh, MR scan parameter differences can affect the fields uh, by quite a lot. And here I'm showing an example of uh, uh, effect on the field simulations in uh, TES. So we have this standard montage uh, and this is what the field roughly looks like. So you see that the field peaks are between the two electrodes uh, or the, the highest field strengths. Um, so what I'm showing here is um, reference segmentation, uh, which was semi done semi-automatically. So it was a combination of automated um, automated segmentation steps and manual corrections. And here uh, the skull was segmented based on a CT scan. So this we consider to be uh, accurate representation of the anatomy of this subject. We generated a, a head model from, uh, from this segmentation and did this standard simulation here. And, and this is what the field looks like. Uh, then we used a new segmentation approach we've been working on uh, to segment the, the same, uh, same head automatically from a T1 segmentation. And here you can see what the, the segmentation looks like overlaid on the T1. And visually, um, the segmentation looks fairly good. Uh, you can see differences, too many big differences at least to the reference segmentation, so nothing really pops out. But if you look at the, the surfaces in more detail, here I'm in yellow showing the, the surfaces from the automated segmentation and in, blue, uh, in red uh, from the uh, manual segmentation. So here again, we see the fat shift. So the fat layer shifts down and the automated segmentation under segments the skull by a little bit and the skin is a little bit overestimated. So the skull is a little bit thinner compared to the, the um, the um, oh, uh, manual segmentations. And if we compare the simulated fields from this model to the, the manual one, uh, we see about 30% uh, 
differences compared to the max uh, maximum field strength here. Uh, so these are quite large differences for such a small sort of segmentation um, segmentation difference. Now, if you include a T2, um, you see that the, the the tissue bars are much much better uh, segmented, so they match the the semi-automated or the reference segmentations better. And we see also that the differences between the fields uh, from the automated uh, using T1 and T2 uh, compared to the reference segmentations uh, are much closer. So here, green and yellow colors are close to, close to zero. So this is exactly the reason why we also recommend having a T2. It not only makes the, uh, makes the segmentations more robust, but also more accurate towards this sort of small uh, differences that might be a more parameter um, dependent when you use only a T1 way to scan. So here uh, we also did the same uh, uh, same simulation for, for TM TMS and here uh, you can see the results on, all at once. So we have again the reference segmentation, the reference field and here now it goes up to two volts per meter and when you do the simulation based uh, on a segmentation using only a T1 way to scan you get this uh, underestimation of the skull and the field differences are now minus 10 to 10 percent of the peak fields here in the, the reference simulation and again if you add a T2 um, the segmentations the automated segmentations match better the, the reference segmentations and, and the field differences go down so those are kind of the things to consider so the take-home messages uh, if, or there's two take-home messages really one is that always check the segmentations for these big segmentation errors that it looks fine using the check functionality and the second thing is that consider adding a t2 uh, to your studies because it makes the segmentations more robust and also uh, remove some of these uh, smaller uh, segmentation differences that you might uh, see when using only a t1 way to scan thanks yeah, yes. thanks for staying with us um, here. Um, so as you might have noticed, there was a little bit of overlap now with the scientific talk of Ula, um, which she gave before. Uh, the reason is that we want to have this this um, recording as a standalone resource later on um, online. We just thought it's important to, to highlight the factors which really influence then the segmentation accuracy. So there's a little bit of of overlap here. But now we go on to, to the next topic, which is then and uh, wasn't covered today, which is Guillaume's talk about um, optimizing, um, systematically optimizing fields for multi channel electric stimulation. Okay, so this here is part three of the introduction to SIMLIP series. And I will talk about optimization of transcranial electric stimulation in SIMLIP 3 or more specifically, Synlib 3.2. So in part one of the series, Axel Tricia gave a general introduction to Synlibs, uh, what it does, how are the basics, how to use the graphical user interface, and how to look at some uh, results. In part two, we had Ula giving an introduction to head model, so our head modeling tools, how to and how to check our results. And now I'll talk about how to use CNIPS in order to optimize transcranial electric stimulation and which factors influence these optimization results and some new features coming up in CNIPS 3.2, which is not yet released, namely optimizing electric field strength and uh, network optimization or distributed target optimization. So in the screen electric stimulation, we place electrodes in the scope in order to create an electric field in the brain. And the head tissues can influence how this electric field uh, actually looks like when it reaches the brain quite a lot. And what modeling tools like CNIPS do is that they allow us, they allow us to estimate the electric field in the brain in a subject specific fashion so that we can take this into account when we do our analysis or when we do our intervention. What we want to do is to take these tools one step further and use them to actually find 
stimulation setups which are optimal to stimulate a given target in a given subject and do it in, an, in, fashion, in a way that's automated and that is reliable. And let's say the main physical tool that we use to do that is linearity or the fact that the head is an ohmic conductor. This means, so let's say I have an anode position here in, I think that's FC3, and a cathode position here over at CZ. And this montage, I do my simulation and I get an electric field that looks like this. Now I do another montage where I, put, I move the electrode posteriorly and I get an electric field that looks different and of course more, more towards the posterior direction. And now let's say that I want to combine both of these simulations and that I want to use both of these electrodes at the same time. What I can do now is um, what this, this linear property or the, the fact that the heads are a conductor allows me to do is that I can just to simulate this condition instead of starting from scratch, I can just sum both of these previous simulations and get the new result. And this here is not an approximation, it's the exact same result I would get by simulating with these two electrodes at the same time. In a little bit of more complicated situation, now let's say that I want to, uh, that I, I can also, for example, reverse this current here and then sum it together with the first one. And in this case, I have actually obtained net zero milliampere current flow throughout my CZ electrode in just a uh, uh, current flow between these two electrodes. And the electric fields do reflect that. You can see that I take by some, I can basically sum this electrode here completely out of the picture. And because of these properties, we can calculate any electric field, uh, electric field given by any co combination of electrodes so far as this position be, uh, kept, are kept fixed with a uh, matrix, vector matrix multiplication here. So here we have E is the electric field, a is the yield field matrix, which is basically a set of basis functions that we can get by simulating with one electrode at a time and keeping one reference electrode fixed. And X is the electrode current at each electrode. These lead fields can be calculated very efficiently by CNIPS in between 15 minutes to one hour. Depends quite a bit on the computer and how much memory you have. Uh, and to calculate it is very simple. So a basic MATLAB code, for example, to calculate a lead field is just four lines. You just need to set um, what we say the this TDCS lead field structure so that CNIP knows it's a lead field simulation. You set the name of the uh, head mesh, so the head mesh that you acquire using that you use. Uh, that you get from running, for example, head recode, the head modeling pipeline that we just talked about, uh, name, and then just go run. Okay, so once we have the lead field at hand, we can now turn our attention to the optimization problem. In For most of the talk, what I'll be talking about with optimization problem is that they want to maximize focality while controlling the electric field in a target. This means that the user will have to set a target position and the direction, as which will look somewhat like here in this picture where I have uh, shown a target in the so-called wall. As you can see, the target is, has, of course, a location, but it also has a direction because as Axel says in the first part of the talk, the electric field is a um, vector field. So that means that it has not only a, 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 let's say a value, it also has a direction and 
most of the optimization will take that into account. We only are now introducing three, in CIMPS 3.2 new optimization routines that do not take direction into account at all. Um, However, this here is set in a nor the normal direction by default in CNIBS. And that is because we, um, to the best of, of the current knowledge in the field, the normal direction, that is the one that is inflowing or outflowing from the cortex surface, is the one which influences uh, the polarization the most and therefore the outcomes of any transcranial electric stimulation intervention the most. So that's what we take into account when setting targets by default. Now, you also need to set the field intensity of the target, and that will be typically something around 0 0.2 volts per meter, 0 0.3 volts per meter, which is also where we think that the EDCS effects begin to, um, where, we begin, where we think that the EDCS begins to actually um, have effects and safety constraints which take the form mostly of a maximum total current injected and a maximum current at each electrode as well as this here is optional a maximum number of active electrodes so it, let's say if you have an eight channel um, multi-channel transcranial electric stimulation system we uh, so that the stimulation take into account how many channels you have now let's see how that looks like in practice. Here, for example, I have some MATLAB code in order to run a simulation. I first start by creating this optimization structure. Then I have to set the DIT field, which is what we previously calculated. I set a name for the optimization, a maximum total current, Use maximum current injected through all electrodes, a maximum current through to that I can inject through each individual electrode. In this case, so this is two milliamps and this is one milliamps. Uh, maximum number of active electrodes, which I set to eight. I set a position for my target and I set an intensity. And then I can now just run. It will take. Uh, it will go fight quite fast, say maybe some 10 seconds. It converged. Okay. Now here's the result. So this little sticks here show where the target is. If I turn this here off for a second, you see that it's actually an arrow pointing down, which shows also the preferential direction that I have for the electric field, which is normal to the cortex in the case in incoming. And here I have the electric field norm, which is the, yeah, the normal strength of the electric field in the cortex from the optimized montage we can see it's nicely centered around this target uh, this uh, around the target region i can also show for example here the electric field vectors which as we see are flowing down here and then to the sides and then are will go out more here to the periphery and finally we can see some of the main electrodes that the optimization uses for this montage. Here is, we fade those out a little bit so you can see the montage better. But we also write down a CSV file with the exact current through each of the electrodes. Now let's say I want to hit the target a little bit harder at 0 0.3 volts per meter. I can just change this line, run again. Okay. 
and I'm done. You notice so that the little the electric field is a little bit more spread out than before, and that comes from an inherent trade-off that we have between intensity at the target and focality. I will discuss more about that soon. Or let's say that I want to change the target position. So how do I get this set of coordinates? Here I have uh, this T1FS conform file open in Freeview. The file can be found here in this M2M folder that Axel um, shows in the first part of the, 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 uh, the series. And then it can just copy over the ROS coordinates here. So this here would be the ROS coordinates for this position where the crosshair is. Okay, save and run. Okay, so this target here happened to be in the Soka wall, meaning that the normal direction is actually along this line. And I can see here the electrode montage. Now, let's say, for example, that I want to go even higher. I can put this here to an basically arbitrary, arbitrarily high number, let's say, uh, 1.0 volt per meter, which is a very high number for an um, electric field intensity. So when I do that, when I place a very high number here, what will happen is synapse will switch. It, it will see that I cannot reach this intensity. And then it will just try to maximize the intensity as best as it can. So it says here, this is going to show something here. That so in this we specified 1.0 achieved 0 0.36. So it could not reach the whole 1.0 that I had set previously. And we can see the result, which is quite a bit more spread out than what I had previously, even though it's a relatively small change actually of the electric field in the target from 0 0.3 to 0 0.36. And so, I have also a very similar interface for Python. So as everything in same lips, basically we have a Python version in the MATLAB version. And I can also have these coordinates that I set here, they are subject specific. However, I can also use, for example, in my night coordinates with the help of this emanate core and natural subject chords function, which is a part of CNIPS. And we also have the same function implemented in Python. Now, going back for the presentation. What we briefly saw with the previous demonstration is a target intensity trade-off. A target, uh, a target intensity and focality trade-off. So here, for example, we have a target located, marked here by the black circle, which is optimized using four different um, electric fields at the target. Here is 0 0.1 volt per meter, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0 0.35. We can see that the electric, the, the, so in here, the electric field is actually being scaled together with the target intensity. So we can see that it gets more and more spread out as we, um, as we increase the intensity of the target. And that is basically a fundamental trade-off because as we want to have a more, uh, a stronger field at the target, we need to 
first of all, focus on just a few electrodes, which are further apart, because those are able to create large electric fields. And we also have less electrodes to, let's say, um, place around, place using this, this kind of concentric ring montages in order to compensate for the off-target electric field because we spend all the budget on these few electrodes to create the, the, the maximum of the uh, larger field of the target. Another factor that plays a very important role in a uh, very important role into how the um, how focal the electric fields can be is where the target is located. Normally we get the best solutions when the target's location is located close on electro because there we can basically we have let's say a, 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 a preferential electrode that we can use in order to create the, the uh, uh, a good set of or a good set of basis functions that we can use in order to create a focal electric field if a target is between electrodes we need to use the more distant electrodes, which will also create a more spread out field. However, for this year, there is, let's say, an easy fix that I'll talk about next slide. However, if the target is deeper in the cortex, because of basically how the electric field physics are, the electric fields need to go through more superficial regions in order to reach the deeper target. Therefore, I would probably not have a maximal here in the deep region, but rather in a more superficial region, region. And there is not much we can do about that using, let's say, basic transcranial stimulation. Uh, if you want a focal target for something like this here, we would need to go to more alternative methods like uh, temporal interference that I would not cover in this talk. Now, uh, as mentioned previously, there is this effect of one electrode being in the surface, but for the away from an electrode, which can cause lower, um, smaller, which can cause less focal fields. Uh, relatively easy fix for that is to just place more electrodes. So here, for example, I have a target. I have the same target. I have the same safety constraints and the same number of electrodes. I just changed basically where I can place more electrodes using a higher density cap versus a lower density cap. If I use a high density cap, I have, for example, these electrodes that I don't have here and that I can effectively use in order to create a more focal electric field. As of now, Synips only has, by default, a EG1010 cap which is relatively low density, but we plan on adding higher density caps in the future as well. And um, another factor which we found that actually does not play such an important role in obtaining focal fields is the number of active electrodes. So if we limit here, also, same kind of setting. Uh, we keep the target constant. We keep the 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 uh, field of the target constant and everything. We just change the number of active electrodes we are allowed to use from four to six and through unconstrained. In this case here, it might go up to sixty. And we see that the electric fields uh, we might have some gains in focality from going to four to six. So, for example, this side lobe here is eliminated but in going from six electrodes to an unconstrained number of electrodes there is actually very little difference in how the electric field looks like and the basic takeaway message from that is we do not really benefit from using let's say a 32 channel ts system for at least for this kind of optimization and yeah, so if you are interested in this kind of comparison, we published in 2019 a paper where we, do, uh, where we run this, this 
this kind of study is not in one or two targets, as I show here, but in 10,000 targets for a very thorough analysis of what matters and what does not matter to obtain focal fields in optimized multi channel transcranial electric stimulation. Now, these definitions that we use, they are very uh, flexible. And they allow, for example, for us to define not only one target, but actually multiple targets simultaneously, which are dependent to a large, which are uh, considered to a large extent to be independent from each other. So here in this example, I have one target in the in each hemisphere. And you can see that it generates kind of two plops, one around each target. To do this kind of optimization is also quite simple. I can just go here. So as you can see, this here is more or less the same as I had before. I just, um, it's the same. I define um, basic info like the HDF file, file, like the lead field file, like the name and safety constraints. And then I just have to define one target and then another target and run, and that's all. Going to run that now. Also, CNIBS allows you to define what we call avoid regions, which is regions that are, let's say, especially, um, especially important for um, the electric field to, where we want spe to have special attention to not have electric fields. So let's say you are optimizing for a target in the uh, a frontal target here, and you obtain a result with an electric field that looks a little bit, a bit like that. However, you are doing TCS, and this kind of electric field in the eyes might induce a lot of false fins, with, which you don't want. You can just set the optimization to especially punish fields in the eyes, and it will then give you a, a different result here, which explicitly avoids the eyes and basically all but eliminates the electric field there. And to do that is also very simple. So here is an example. Mm, no, not here. Rather here, all I need to do is to set this opt dot avoid, and then in this case, I set to the tissue 1006, which corresponds to the eyes, in order to let's say punish the, the field there and therefore avoid having any electric field in the eyes. So, um, so there we can, from this, um, from this display, we can say which factors are important for obtaining focal fields and which are not. What we find mostly is that the most important factors are target location and electrode cap. So having, a, a, in general, that's because having a, a target close, uh, an electrode close to the target is very important in order to, to create a focal electric field. And second, I would say, comes the target intensity and safety limits. I mean, this here is all relative, of course, depending on the ranges that you're working on. But the, as we saw, there's this focal uh, intensity trade off, and the more intense you want the field to be, the less focal it will be. And safety limits, uh, because safety limits are larger, largely responsible for this trade-off, we can, um, we can, of course, up, up to some extent, compensate one with the other one. And what I would say actually matters the most, matters the least, is the number of active electrodes beyond approximately eight. We do not really uh, make use of this many electrodes in the optimization solutions. And this year is more investigated in our 2019 neuro image paper, as I said previously, with 10,000 targets. So, and there's also some interactions that we 
might be aware of, as I just mentioned before, target density and current limit are more or less two sides of the same coin. So if you increase the target density, you can largely compensate it by increasing the current limits, that, that is the safety limits of how much you, in, you currently inject through each electrode and through all electrodes. And also by increasing the number of targets, you can also benefit from, if you are, have a large number of targets, you can also make use of um, increased current limits and more active electrodes. So you can more independently uh, focus fields around each of the, your targets. Now for some new features. Um, so as we said previously in CNIPS, 3.1, we have to define a preferential direction for the optimization. That makes a lot of sense in cortical targets because we have a good amount of evidence that the normal direction is the most important one for any, any TES effects. However, in subcortical targets, this preferential direction is often clear and so it might be preferable to optimize the, the strength of the electric field or the norm of the electric field. So I'm using the same thing instead. And so implemented that in CNIPS 3.2 is quite a trickier problem from the optimization perspective to, to work with. And here in this example, I've Optimize for target for a subcortical target market here in black for two four different for three different um, three different intensities 0 0.2 volt per meter 0 0.4 and 0 0.52. We also see this kind of intense focal intensity trade off with the electric with the electric fields basically getting more and more in focus as we go. But because this court this target is quite deep in the cortex. We also see this effect whereby we cannot really make a focal electric field here. So we still have a much larger electric field in, in a much larger electric field in superficial areas. To run that is quite straightforward as well. All I need to do is to set directions here to none. And it also supports multi-target multi optimization, as I showed previously for the directional case. I can also set up uh, different, uh, I can also set up several targets with independent directions and positions. And also a new feature for CNIPS 3.2 is distributed targets or network optimization. In this feature, you will be able to use a resting state functional network as a target. So for example, you can get a T-value map and use it as a target for an optimization. So you can target the whole network instead of having to select uh, just a small set of positions. And it is also implemented in a quite easy to use fashion. So you need, we are using a little bit different structure than before. What we need to select here again is the lead field, uh, name for the optimization, the subject folder is also needed for this case, safety constraints. We have also an electric field intensity, which has a slightly different meaning in this case which is going to be like a, more like a mean value. And uh, target image, which in this case here is just a T-map obtained from SPM in MNI space. And the same image will automatically load this image, transform it to subject space and do the optimization. So in conclusion, these optimization algorithms allows, allow us to automatically find electrode montages that can 
reach and latitude in the target region while minimizing it elsewhere. Uh, the quality of the solution is quite variable as it depends on things such as the position of the target, the density of the electrode cap you are using, the target density, and so on. And Synips has algorithms for transcranial analytics for optimization of transcranial analytics stimulation in cortical targets as of Synips 3.1 and subcortical targets and functional, net, functional networks will be implemented soon in the 3.2 release. Yeah, so thank you. And so Synips is freely available at synips.org and is developed by the Neurophysics Group at the Danish Research Center for Magnetic Resonance, the RCMR, and the Technical, Den Technical University of Denmark, DTU in Professor Axel Teacher's lab, together with external collaborators. And we would like to thank our, our funding sources for the support. And also thank you for watching. Yeah, so thanks for watching. Um, so, um, Let's see whether there are further questions. There are a few in the in the chat I will still like to answer. Um, so maybe I just take them now, not via chat, just uh, just um, orally because it's faster. So uh, one thing was still from from Gabi asking whether this uh, optimization for of the networks will be also available for S. And the answer is no, because um, actually. It's quite easy to make the TDCS field like unfocal to match this distributed pattern which you have for, uh, for example, for these resting state patterns. But TMS focality is is more or less um, fixed uh, and and mostly defined by the by the TMS coil. So there, uh, I would rather say um, there this the, the other approach which was actually mentioned in the introduction talk by Alex today um, to try to hit a node. Of the of the network as much as possible by TMS by optimally positioning the coil would be the better ones better uh, um, option, and for that there's a small tool in in Simnips to where uh, there's a grid search meaning that um, you can define a target, um, and then it will just search across uh, uh, systematically across a few positions around the target and different orientations to best match. Um, this um, this position. So this grid search was was contributed by uh, Konstantin Weise from from Leipzig, and uh, there's also examples uh, when you go to to tutorials. Um, there's an example to how to use that. 